Business Council of Australia is hosting business leaders in Wollongong today for a discussion around some of the significant issues faced by the nation's economy. Chief News anchor Kieran Gilbert was there. Welcome to the Strong Australia in Illawarra, coming to you from Wollongong this afternoon. With me is Jennifer Westacott, the head of the BCA, Mark Fasella, CEO of Blue Scope, and Jason Economides, Chief Operating Officer at South32. Great to see you all. We've had a really interesting discussion this afternoon. Mark, first to you with Blue Scope, you're nearing a hundred years of steel making in Port Kembla. A wonderful legacy, but also you've got some very interesting plans for the future as well. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I mean, a significant milestone for Blue Scope, almost 100 years of steel making. Uh, we have our challenges as steel industry. We're dealing with decarbonisation. Uh, we also have a blast furnace reline project, a very large investment that's under feasibility study right now, which will be the bridge for us to the newer green steel technologies or low emission steel technologies that will emerge over the coming decades. And uh, our ability to align and invest in those new technologies as and when they become viable is what I see as the investment future for the Illawarra region. So a fantastic, yeah. a fantastic milestone, but lots more to come in terms of investment in the region. Well, you said you'll be here for another 100 years. So that says, says to me that the government landed the safeguard mechanism for heavy emitters appropriately in your view? Yes, there was great recognition from the federal government that some industries are just hard to abate and the steel industry is one of those. There's others, but certainly the steel industry is technology challenged at this stage around emissions. So recognition in the safeguard mechanism of the hard to abate industries and the decline rates that we can meet at this stage has been fundamental to us continuing to reinvest in the region. Jennifer Westacott, the, the steel industry obviously plays a big part in a whole range of industries including renewable energy. Absolutely. Well, there aren't many uh, wind turbines that don't have steel in them. Uh, there aren't many houses that don't have steel in them. Uh, but the other thing that Mark's doing is, you know, what we really want the whole economy to do, which is value add, you know, the colour bond product, which is an incredible innovation. So it's, it's playing a role in, in every aspect of the economy, but it's going to be crucial to the decarbonisation agenda. If you think about all of that componentry for, for solar, for wind turbines, for uh, you know, everything that's going to power up a clean economy. The colour bond. Colour bond. Uh, that came out of this facility here in Port Kembla. Absolutely. And then the things that you can do with the built form, so form flow, which is kind of comes out of Blue Scope, uh, you know, they're building unbelievably energy efficient buildings using uh, that form flow product. And, you know, fire resistant, incredibly thermally efficient, low cost energy, that's the sort of stuff that you know a blue scope is able to sort of generate, and and once we get renewables really going, um, the steel from blue scope becomes less carbon intensive in terms of the production of the steel, yeah. and suddenly our export markets are opening up again because people look at the quality, the production cost, the the low emissions production cost. Suddenly we're back in the game exporting. And there's also the point, Jason, from from the, your perspective that, that there's not just the one type of coal. You've got the thermal coal. There are alternatives to thermal coal in energy, but in steel making, metallurgical coal, as you're providing to Blue Scope and others, there is no alternative when it comes to steel making. No, th there's no substitute for um, the metallurgical coal. And you know, we believe that for the next 10 to 20 plus years, there won't be. So as a result, you know, we're, our commitment is to providing high quality metallurgical coal to our customers because that's our best contribution to make sure that we've got low emissions products. There is a transition on though. How is South32 dealing with the energy transition and the pathway to net zero? Yeah, so we've, we've got a number of projects around the world um, that need the most attention. Uh, we speak locally, Illawarra is one. Uh, one of the things that we have is you know, we produce a lot of methane. In our pre-drainage, we use that methane uh, through EDL to provide energy. We provide enough electricity to power 60,000 homes. So that's what we do with that. We're also working on the balance of that. So the, the methane, the low purity methane that comes out of our vent stream, we're actually working on how do we destroy that to actually have no, uh, no impact or a much lesser impact. So that is a project that we're working on with the New South Wales government and CSIRO to work on commercialising that opportunity. And once we get that commercialised, that'll be important for every gassy underground coal mine in the world. That's 
Yeah, very quite uh, exciting, that prospect. Mark, uh, in terms of rejuvenation or a new approach, you've got a big rejuvenation happening here at Port Kembla. 200 hectares of space that you're going to have some urban renewal. Mm. Tell our viewers about that because uh, anyone that's been to Wollongong knows Port Kembla. This sounds like a very exciting prospect for the region. A terrific opportunity. We've identified about 200 hectares of surplus land in and around the Stirlworks. So land that we don't currently use and don't envisage we'll use in the future. And we're currently going through a, a master planning exercise with a, a globally awarded urban planning organisation out of Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, they're, they're incredibly excited about the scale of this opportunity, as are we, and to Jennifer and Jason's point, 200 hectares where we can attract renewable energy industries, defence industries, high-tech manufacturing in and around the steelworks. Uh, we think there's an opportunity here to find employment for another 20 or 30,000 people in the region in related industries and use the infrastructure, the surplus infrastructure that we have as part of the urban planning exercise. Yeah, that renewal is, is quite something, isn't it? And an, an iconic space for yeah. the Illawarra. Yeah, and you could do something like is like what what's being done in Western Sydney. You can put like an advanced manufacturing research centre there. From that, you can put like a skills hub. Then you can do bring in the other industries uh, that are going to support the steelworks in its next hundred years. Like the 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 opportunities are endless, but you can also create incredible urban uh, environment in terms of like you know, great design, you know, water reuse, the kind of circular economy. When you've got 200 hectares of land, you can do a lot of very innovative things on it in that industrial side of things. And I think people forget that the diversification of the Australian economy is not, is not the digitisation of the Australian economy. That's one aspect of it. But there is so much we could do around the industrial base of the economy and having a 200 hectare greenfield site you know what you could do there in terms of powering up new industries is just endless. It's such a, a low unemployment rate at the moment. How are you dealing with that, Jason, in terms of trying to get workers and skilled workers? Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing at the moment is making sure that we provide the opportunity for lots of different people um, to be able to work for us. So from an inclusion and diversity point of view, one of the things that we're trying to do is have a workforce that mirrors our background demographic. So in doing that, we're actually having to look at our rostering, we're having to look at how do we actually have people for childcare, support people in childcare, how do we change the work environment so that anyone, whether it's an ageing workforce or whether it's female participation or anyone else, that we can provide the best opportunities for them to work in our industry. It's still a big employer, yours isn't it, in Wollongong. What's your plans in terms of attracting new people to, to work for you? Because it's not easy right now, it's a tight labour market. It is a tight labour market and, and I would echo the, the, the work that Jason and South 32 are doing. We're doing the same thing for our, for our trades and operator staff. But equally, notwithstanding the challenges for the steel industry around decarbonisation, uh, that's attracting people in its own right. And, and I think in some ways, Kieran, we can create an environment here where it feeds on itself. People want to be part of the transition. They want to be part of the, the technological challenge and the engineering challenge that's decarbonisation. So we're finding people are attracted to that challenge. They want to be part of the transition. And if we can develop our urban master plan, attract other industries, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of attracting talented people working in those industries, how they can continue to learn and develop. Well, it's a, it's a sovereign capability that we can't, we can't lose. Oh. It, it's, not, it's not something you would want to see just yeah. shift offshore. Well, absolutely. And then if you think about AUKUS and all of the things that are going to hang off the AUKUS supply chain in terms of production and, uh, you know, the, the sort of things that are going to be needed um, as part of that supply chain. But I think we learned a lesson in COVID that, you know, we, we have to start to shore up our sovereign capability in key areas. Mm. But it's also an opportunity too. I mean, we produce incredibly high quality steel. We produce some the world's most high quality uh, metallurgical coal. Why wouldn't we back those advantages in? Why wouldn't we keep going with that? Because the big supply chains of the world, they need it. And we should be sort of opening that up, thinking about where we can value add, because that's going to take Australia to that frontier economy I always talk about. Better jobs, high paid jobs, more skilled people, you know, an economy with a two or a three in front of its GDP number, not a one. And, and you touched on it, but 
and, and you were, were in India with the Prime Minister recently, and it's an insatiable demand for more steel in, in that country, isn't, isn't it? And it's growing. So if, if that's happening there, it'd be ludicrous if we were to just to, to end our capacity here. Sure. And, and more steel that's produced from highly efficient coal. So you're right, there's no, there's no logic in exporting our industry, exporting that carbon, only to turn around and send it back again. This, this is a global challenge around emissions reduction. It shouldn't just be a local challenge. So we need to think about this globally and producing products here from the most efficient available natural resources makes all the sense in the world. And is, is green steel still, you know, is it a prospect in the foreseeable future? Um, or is it more about what Jennifer alluded to earlier in terms of the energy sources that you're using will get cleaner, therefore the product gets cleaner? Or do you see green steel as achievable? It's a global industry challenge and, and it's really being attacked on two fronts. There's, there's improving your existing processes and, and making them as carbon efficient as you can whilst thinking about the future steel making technologies. We're still some way off with those technologies in terms of their commercial viability. And they're very dependent on, on enablers like raw materials, renewable energy, hydrogen potentially. Uh, but you need to attack it on both fronts, Kieran, and we're, we're investing in that. The, the, the steel industry globally understands the decarbonisation challenge and they're taking it on. Jennifer Westacott, finally to you. We've been recently in the Hunter, today in the Illawarra. What's your message to the government a couple of days out from the budget as to how they can boost these regional and very important economies? Well, I think overall we need a plan for growth. Uh, and, you know, we want to see in the budget, you know, those um, indicators that we're going to try and grow the economy faster. But that's about making really key investments in skills. It's about investing in the infrastructure in key places like the Illawarra, like the Hunter, like Western Sydney. Uh, it's also about making it easier to attract investment. So, you know, you know I'd like to see an extension of the expensing uh, allowances because they brought a lot of investment in. It's about making sure we can compete for these big projects because if the United States keeps going with this Inflation Reduction Act, they'll just suck a whole lot of investment into the United States. Now we need to be competitive so we want to see something on investment making things easier to do. Obviously I'd love to see a big skills package about reskilling people but about getting the skills for the industries that are going to power up the economy and finding faster ways of doing it. Jennifer Westicott from the BCA, Mark Vassella from Blue Scope and Jason Economides from South32. Thanks for being part of Strong Australia here in Illawarra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.